concept of IP Dendo has been there for quite some time because we have been trying to solve problems in a EV fashion so that we are able to uh, really identify and evaluate complicated pediatric endocrine problems uh, in an appropriate fashion. A number of approach pathways which will allow you to approach to a particular endocrine condition, manage pathways, calculators, diagnostics, therapeutics, and knowledge banks. So it's like, how does it work? We have got 31 approach pathways, which basically covers every condition that you will encounter as pediatric endocrinologist. We have got around 13 uh, management pathways, which cover the obvious possibilities. And when you talk about these pathways, they actually look simple when you solve them, but they are actually very complicated algorithms. So there are various uh, weightages which are given to different situations so that we want to select the lowest resources required to reach a diagnosis. So if you want to evaluate for growth failure, we would like to keep IGF-1 at the end. If you want to evaluate for some complicated uh, calcium disorder, we'll keep calcitriol at the end. So the algorithm is designed so as to ensure that it is resource uh, appropriate and the cost benefit ratio is there in that situation. Then we provide uh, personalized prescriptionized management and we'll discuss that all throughout that. Now, it basically is a very simple user interface. You just go to the disorder you're looking at and then you answer a few questions. Yes, no, you will get the answer. And we'll go through about that in that situation. Now, this is available at both the Android as well as the iOS platforms. You can just go and download from there. All you have to do is to register. You will have a free access for seven days for the entire app in which you can look through. After that period, you will have access to specific things which are essential, like growth interpreter, like DK. A few of them will remain. Others are for a very nominal subscription in that regards. Now, many of these the courses come bundled with their subscription. So if you take the course, automatically the bundle becomes from there. Just to go through a bit, the approach pathway basically uses evidence-based algorithm approach. And the way it is that you have to choose a condition. So suppose you want to approach delayed puberty in boys, you will answer a few questions and all these are taking you to one section of algorithm. Now there will be around 100 possibilities which are there, but you will reach like in this case, you have reached 17 beta HSD deficiency. So it will end up at a particular diagnosis. Now this is uh, uh, counterintuitive, but this is going to be quite helpful in reaching a diagnosis when you don't have access to expertise, which is not there everywhere. The management pathways similarly use the algorithmic approach. So like if you have hyperkalemia, it will ask the level of potassium, ECG changes, then it will guide you through with emergent management. So all your protocols are pretty much there. You don't need to go ahead and read it. And we give information specifically about doses also if it's required at that point of time. The diagnostic sections was developed uh, largely by Dr. Riti. And it provides extensive information. So if you want to prescribe a test, it will give you all the information which is relevant. And every single test which is there in pediatric endocrinology is provided there, along with ranges which are difficult to find often in that situation. The therapeutics by Dr. Sajini has around 64 drugs used in pediatric endocrinology. If you want to know about any in terms of doses, indications, contraindications, you will get all information about a particular drug. Like for Desmopressin, it provides this information. So in case of a 12-year-old girl, height is 132, weight is 20. Now the key question that is to be answered by the pediatrician is, is she short? Does she require evaluation? What investigations are more important and how do we prioritize them? Now if we just go in terms of a basic concept, growth failure is common. 2.5% of all children will be short because it's a statistical definition. 80% of this will be physiological and 10% will have a pathological cause. Now, the role of you as a treating physician is to not do unnecessary workup in these patients while not missing on these pathology. Now, growth failure can be a serious underlying condition like a life-changing disease like celiac disease or a life-threatening disease like a craniopharyngeal. So, you don't want to miss those 10 but don't do all the investigations here. So a lot of this research work that we have done in our own patient group has led to the development of our algorithm, which we'll show subsequently. So now, what really three questions I said, is it growth failure? Is it physiological or pathological? Because 80% for a pediatrician will be physiological. 
is it primary or secondary and when we say primary primary means basically dysplasia and hga now when we say physiological we are talking about constitutional delay and familial short stature now what is the key feature which tells us that this is going to be a physiological short stature uh, uh, sign so we need to first see whether the child is short for his parents mm -hmm. uh, if the child is not short for his parents we can go for a diagnosis of familial yeah. and then we have to ask for the history of whether the parents also had delayed puberty delayed menarche mm -hmm. and then we can think of cdgp but cdgp is a diagnosis of exclusion we have to rule out the pathological causes also in that case so that's a very important point so this become very important because here even without many investigations all you need to do is a growth chart a pubertal assessment and a bone age these three will give you the diagnosis and this is what we will do over the next 15 minutes or so to show how very simply you can classify this 80 percent now now this primary how do you identify these primary causes pratik a growth failure dysplasia and sga so the uh, proportions so just have to look at the faces look him head to toe look at the body proportions birth weight and you will get the diagnosis The problem happens is when you compare these nutritional from an endocrine cause, and this is important because nutritional cause like celiac disease, malabsorption, malnutrition, tuberculosis, renal tubular acidosis will have a different set of investigations. While endocrine like Cushing syndrome, hypothyroidism, pseudo hyperparathyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, Turner syndrome will have a different group of investigations. So one approach is that you investigate everybody. Now, if you follow some of the protocols like the Dutch guidelines, which are very good in terms of all these things, they talk about a, a, a basically a blanket approach. You know, all investigation is the main, which is okay if you are not having issues of resources. But we cannot have all the investigations in everybody, so that becomes very important. So, differentiating these two would be very important. So, from a researcher perspective, if you want to really decide about making an algorithm for growth failure, what you want is first a pointer which will tell you this is physiological. Second, this is easy because this is a clinical assessment. Second would be differentiation between a endocrine cause from a nutritional cause, and third would be the priority of investigation. So, we did a complete. analysis of around 900 patients and then we came out with algorithm which we feel is very helpful in in a resource appropriate evaluation which we'll discuss subsequently now the first issue of course is is it growth failure or not now that brings us to the basic question how do we decide that something is a disease when you say i want a disease how do you decide that this is a criteria for a disease that i mean the population based yes So one you can compare with a population based standard, but let's say if you have a population which has got 30 percent prevalence of diabetes, and you use blood sugar as a criteria, in that case that will not work well because you will say only five percent of diabetes because you're using the population standard criteria. So wherein you have a end point outcome that okay this level of sugar goes high and you have a complication in the long run. there you can use a different way if you look blood pressure so if your blood pressure is more than 130 90 there is a greater chance of having a cardiac mortality than it is less so there you can use a objective criteria but true for delayed puberty precocious puberty growth period has to be a population standard so what you do in population standard is compare how far that particular individual is from the mean and this is a very very important concept because we all are very well versed with percentiles but we are not with standard deviation scores so what i'm trying to do is to go a bit about sts so that it becomes much easier to interpret what we were talking about so this is a bell shaped normal distribution what is the fundamental characteristic of a normal distribution sign so it is symmetrical yes the mean the median and the mode all three are same so this is the mean the median the mode now from there you look at the deviation of individual based upon how far the individual is there so there are two measures one is percentile and what the one is sts what is percentile prati percentile means 99% will not have this i mean our your more than 99 percentile of that So percentile is just a grade. If you arrange hundred children in an increasing order of height, if you are twenty fifth percentile, twenty five will be behind. That's pretty much the percentile. 
But then when you say less than third centile, it doesn't make any sense. Because if you are at 2.9 percentile, and if you are at 0 0.00029 percentile, it's a huge difference. So when you say less than third percentile, for me, it has no objective relevance. That is why we need to talk about very important objective term, which is a standard deviation score. So if you look here, 0, and this minus 1, plus 1, these are the standard deviation scores. So roughly one standard deviation score is somewhere around 16 percentile. That's what it's coming out. And we'll use the formula and show you how it is. But standard deviation score is a more precise term in that regards. And remember, a fundamental flaw is if minus 2.3 bigger or less or minus 2.4. No, no, no. Which is more? Minus 2.3, minus 2.4? 2.3 is 2.3, yes. Because people get, often get confused when we say less than minus 2, it means minus 2.1, 2.2. I'm just going to very basic aspects because unless you understand that, there will be a lot of confusion there. Now, if you look at increasing order of height, this is the child at 80th, this becomes a 80th percentile. So this is a rank, this is a ranking. While when you talk about standard deviation score is how far are you from the average. So this is the difference which is given. It's a very more quantifiable measure. And you measure standard deviation score by basically using an observed minus expected upon the standard deviation for that particular age. This is how you calculate standard deviation score. So if you compare percentile from SPS, you will know that percentile is for ranking. It is not very good marker of severity and its role is not there in follow-up. So if he was less than third centile, you gave growth hormone for two years, he's still less than third centile. Does it make sense? He was minus six SDS, now he's minus three SDS. So he has gained three SDS. That's why the standard deviation score or a Z score becomes very important. And these are rough ideas as to how SPS corroborates with percentile in that regards. So minus one is 15, minus two is 2.3, minus 2.25 is one, and minus three is 0.1. So when you say minus three standard deviation score, it is 99.9% .9 of the population will be tolerant. When you say minus two, it will mean that 2.3 percentage is tolerant. So the, when it looks, doesn't look that intuitive, but when you say minus two to minus three, you are actually increasing the rarity of the disease by 23 times. So minus three standard deviation score is 0.1 percentile and minus two is 2.3. So when you say minus two to minus three, okay, you say it's not a big deal. No, it is 23 times less likely for an individual to be below minus three. That is very, very important concept to understand. So this is how we compare the percentile that. Now we'll go back to your initial question, is the child short or not? Now to answer that, all you have to do is to look at the chart. Now if you look at this child, Narayanan, what do you think? Is he short? The one on the lowest part? Absolutely, because this child you don't need to wait. You can't give him zinc, calcium and iron for years. So very simple way, you can say very short, below first centile, and I would say minus three standard deviations for as we'll discuss later on. He would require it. If you have a child who is there, fine, what will you think about the second child who is around this just below the percentile? This child is also short. Mm -hmm. between, uh, if the child follows up, we can know the height of So better would be to follow him yeah. up. You can wait for some time. What about this child, Pratik? Why would you evaluate the third child? I would say this is the most severe out of all of them because yes. he's losing height. So some onset has happened when he's. So if you are basically not growing at all, this is dangerous. This means that something new has happened. Either he has developed hypothyroidism or he may have developed a brain tumor also in that regards. So short, short and not growing and not growing at all become important. So crossing of two or more percentile lines between the age of two years and puberty is considered to be significant at any point of time. Now, how do we make it objective? So this is the study I was referring to and we did an analysis of around 870 patients presenting to our clinic over a four year period who actually presented with growth failure, who were evaluated extensively and had a final diagnosis. So these are all those patients who had a final diagnosis we, and had at least six months follow up after that. So these are not the routine patients who came once and we lost to follow up. So it's a very, very solid down the diagnostic criteria and what we see is that only 2.5% children who were below minus 2 standard deviation score had a 
and if you really look closely to that all of them had either a low weight or they had a gi center and most clinical features we may not need to do any evaluation this is what is coming out now when you go to minus 2 it basically goes up to 42.6 And at minus three, it goes to eighty point four percent. So from two point five to forty to eighty. So if somebody is below minus three, four fifth of them have a pathology. This is a big message. You cannot miss them. So if you just look at the traffic light approach, if you are more than minus two, fine enough. Minus two to minus three, you may wait and watch. And less than minus three, you need to evaluate. So this is the first step of our algorithm, whether you need evaluation or not. Now the second question is: Is it physiological or is it pathological? And to answer that, you have to look at three things: the growth chart, the puberty development, and the bone age. And all three are difficult. Often people are not trained appropriately in terms of doing a proper growth chart interpretation, puberty assessment, and bone age. And if you fumble on that, that will have a drastic effect ultimately. So what we have done in our app is all three now. Are just on a click of button, so you can just get a right growth interpretation, puberty assessment, and more. And we'll show you how. So, growth chart. You're looking at three things. What is the absolute status of the child? How is he compared to the population that is percentile, or you can say heights estimates? I think this is very very clear. The second is comparison with the parents. So, when you want to compare to the parents. You look at target height, and we all know how target height is calculated. So you basically have mother's and father's height divided by two, and add six point five for boys, subtract six point five for girls. Then, if you want to go into SDS, and this is very important, we also look at target height SDS. So how are the parents at final height? That gives you the target height SDS, and then you subtract. The target height from the current height it gives you the corrected height SDS. <coughs> Now, why is corrected height SDS important? Because this is the best measure to differentiate familial short stature from a non-familial short stature. There is a wonderful study which was published three decades ago, which showed that if you have a height standard deviation which is corrected for the family more than minus one point six, it is familial. Less than minus 1.6 is considered to be non-familial. So therefore, this parameter you have to always mark. Unfortunately, many of the applications which actually are there, and there are plenty of applications which give you a lot of data, they do not give you information about corrected standard deviation score. And this is something which is very, very important from our algorithm perspective. The third thing is whether it is nutritional or endocrine. Now, this becomes important. And we all talk about height, age, and weight age as to how in nutritional causes the weight is more affected. The height is weight affected. If you have got more height affected, it is endocrine. If it is weight, it is nutritional. But what would be the objective criteria for that? So Riddhi actually evaluated for three parameters. One was the weight standard deviation score. Second one was the weight minus height standard deviation score, and the third was BMI standard deviation score. And what we found is the BMI standard deviation score was a good marker for a nutritional pathology if it is less than minus. So this again is the output that we give, and it will be very easy when you interpret from that perspective. Now we have looked into the second part: is is it familial? So as I discussed, this archives data. If the height, corrected height SDS is less than or equal to 1.5, it means that this is non-familial. You got that? Now the second question is. Is it CDGP? This is a very, very important question because in our experience, CDGP is more common than familial short stature. So we looked into multiple parameters which can indicate the possibility of CDGP. Now, if you just think about it, Narayan, and what will be the way which will which will help you differentiate CDGP from a normal child? Family history and all those things we have discussed, but that is not an objective criteria. When we say this child is short. He is not short for the family. That is familial short stature. What will be not short for what will tell you this is CDG. He is not short for his age. Age is obviously there. Pubertal status or bone age. Bone age because pubertal status is not a. You can't do it as an objective criteria. So what we really evaluated is 
what happens to the high standard deviation score for bone age in CDGP versus other endocrine bodies. And there is a huge difference. And what we found that if you use the high standard deviation score for bone age, which is more than minus 2, it is unlikely to be GHD. It is much more likely to be CDG. So that we use this another parameter which is not given anywhere in other outputs. In our app, we give this high test gear for bone age, which really helps you out really reach a diagnosis from that. So if your high test gear for bone age is more than minus two, it is likely CDG. You of course follow them up and see how they go from there, but this is most likely CDG. This is the nutritional part. So we looked down to the BMI SPS, the weight SPS, and we looked at the ROC curve. So all of this is not coming out of just we have thought of something and started talking. It's all based upon specific studies which we have done in that situation. And what we find is that BMI SPS differentiates well between nutritional and endocrine with one big thing you have to remember. Celiac disease is something which you cannot exclude if your BMI SPS is more than minus one. We have many number of patients with celiac who may have a normal BMI. So what we are trying to say is that in areas where celiac is common, TTG has to be an initial investigation. You cannot say that your BMI SPS is more than minus one, I will not do TTG. That is not justified. So this has really come out very nicely from our study. But other things like IgA deficiency, RTA, IBD will be very unlikely if your BMI SPS is more than minus one. So this is an important caveat to remember that for celiac, you have to evaluate irrespective of the situation in that regard. Now, once you have looked into the next issues, of course, pubertal development, and when we talk about pubertal development, we all know about talent staging, how it is done. What I'm going to say is that the most important part is breast stage two. Any papilla elevation would mean that now the girl has entered puberty and this has to be differentiated from lipomastia. So all you have to do is to approximate your thumb and finger. If there is resistance, this means that there is a breast tissue. From here, there will be a growth spurt and from the growth spurt to menarche, it is around 22 to 2.5 years is the usual time, which is there at that point of time. And the growth rate will be around 8 centimeters. So from breast stage 2 to final height is around 20 centimeters, breast stage 4 to final height is 8 to 10 centimeters, menarche to final height is 5 to 7 centimeters. So if you have a girl who comes to you with a height of 135, at this stage she will land up at 155, she will land up around 145 and with menarche 140. So this is how you should interpret puberty. Now about uh, very important thing, of course, about boys is that you have to focus mainly on the testicular volume. And if the testicular volume is more than 4 ml, which basically means that there is a pubertal development which is there, more than 10 ml, you would really think of a possibility that now the growth spurt is happening. So if you have a short child here, wait and watch. If you have a short child who has a testicular volume of 10, Maybe weight watch, but beyond 15, you don't have any time left. You have to immediately start working up and evaluating. So always compare height with puberty before you really want to do any evaluation in that perspective. Now, we have simplified it very easily in the form of this channel staging. All you have to do is that there are an analytic area. Go to that, you compare the breast state and you compare the pubic hair state and you will get an appropriate Tanner staging outcome, which is there. This is one of our calculators, which is there. Now we have, we are also looking at the possibility where the patients can directly assess themselves and how reliable they are. This is something which would be quite helpful in places where privacy issues are there. One can easily do it this way, like school studies also. This can be a good tool to go forward. Now, once we have discussed about these two things, the third and the most important thing is the bone age. The problem with bone age is that radiologists either don't know or don't want to do a good bone age, and that's a major limitation. Now, when you look at a bone age X-ray, which is the most important site to look at? None. The interphalangeal joints. The joints, okay? It depends upon what age the child is coming to you. So basically, the uh, uh, maturity happens from proximal to distal, and fusion happens from distal to proximal. So if you have a very small child, you can focus here. As you grow older, and most children who come to you with short stature, you will require to look at these small bones will be the most important. If you look at long bones, you are already very late 
in that perspective of evaluation. Now, always girls have an advanced bone age in that regards. Now, if you look at how to do the x-ray, often we get an x-ray which is cut. So always get all the fingers which are there. They should all be spread, not very, very close. There are specific guidelines. If you look at our book, there's a guideline as to how far should the hand be from that. I'm not going to do all that because that would be more confusing. But you want a good exposure and a proper spread of fingers. Now, which areas to look at? And of course, this is a generic thing for younger children. Look at the carpal bones. From most of our interest area, you look at the epiphysis size and then you look at the distal bone for fusion. So this is the way it has been done. Now, the problem with bone age assessment has been that there were a lot of tools available, but some of them were very complicated. You need to go, you have an atlas, the read the atlas, it took time. There were comparative things. So we want to develop a simplified tool to validate that and compare with the standard. So on that, there was a very good work which was done by uh, Riddhi, and she will be sharing about how we have developed a very simplified way of doing a bone age in that regard. So. Uh, what was the aim of uh, development of our mobile application? Uh, that we were able to develop the simple and accessible tool, which is validated against the gold standard method of, uh, method of Tenavita OS3, which is comparable with the currently available method of bone expert, and most importantly, uh, the known expert user, the pediatrician, which are not using routinely bone age in their practice, they were able to do it uh, easily. So uh, our method was developed from 307 radiographs by three expert users and based on age and gender analysis, 13 different sites, which is recommended by Tenor White House 3, were initially selected and then they uh, from those 13 Thin sites, top five sites were selected based on regression analysis from the uh, validation of these sites from 200 uh, radiographs. After that, these sites were loaded on mobile platform and then validated with the Tenovite House 3 method by two expert users in 250 radiographs. And the precision and accuracy of our method was calculated using the various statistical parameters. Uh, we also uh, calculated the precision and accuracy and uh, time of assessment of the bone age from both mobile application as well as standard by both expert and non-expert users. So here user has to uh, just uh, look with the morphological feature of the only five sites that includes the uh, middle phalanx of middle finger, proximal uh, phalanx of middle finger, proximal phalangeal epiphysis of thumb, ulnar and radial epiphysis. So what user has to see is the, uh, uh, every has, everyone has to select the size, shape, and uh, whether white line is visible on the epiphysis or not, whether capping has been started or not, or whether fusion has been started or not. So it is very easy. You have to just select the, this parameters and you have to keep this uh, in, in your mind and select with the best match uh, parameter in our mobile app. You don't have to remember the site of the uh, name of the site. You have to just select uh, the bone age of our mobile application where press the gender, select age of uh, uh, date of the birth, and then select the best morphological match of this site. Like in this uh, X-ray, the middle uh, uh, epiphysis of the middle phalanx is um, close match with this uh, site. Then press on this. Then proximal phalanx of middle finger. Then also select, uh, also look for the white line. Like in thumb, both the white line are visible and uh, the epiphysis is slightly longer than metaphysis. After that, ulna and radial epiphysis. So after selecting only these five sites, you will get the bone age and also the range of the bone age. So, so we have also compared our mobile application based bone age assessment with gold standard method of Tena White House 3 from 250 radiographs. And we found that there is similar intra-individual and inter-individual variability like Tena White House 3 method. So it, is, it has a similar accuracy and precision like Tena White House 3 method. And in comparison with, with Bone Expert, our mobile application has 
better accuracy because it has lower root mean square error and lower relative standardized difference as compared to bone experts so it is more accurate as compared to bone expert and even among non expert user the difference between mobile application and tenabyte out stream method is only 5 mins that is negligible difference and that is uh, comparable with bone experts so accuracy among non expert user is lower but it is in acceptable range and we have we have been also able to reduce the time of assessment of bone age that is around 50% for both expert and non expert user that was significant reduction so we can uh, easily do bone age assessment in our routine practice so we we have been able to develop the uh, mobile application which is simple and accessible which is validated against the gold standard and which is superior to bone expert and even any pediatrician or non expert user can do it in their routine practice to do in that regard is that you've got this particular x ray and what you need to do is to really compare that particular site with a specific site so there are five preloaded sites as rithi has said all you have to do is to compare each site so there this is the first one the middle finger middle finger you have to compare with the most suited x ray in that regard so when you compare that you select that particular button the next thing you do is to compare the next site and again you have to look which is the closest to that particular site the key thing you should look at is overall the shape how they are looking and how they are comparing to the equipment so there are five regions which you have to basically compare we have got two from the middle phalanx we have got one from the thumb one from radius and one from ulna so there is a five the rough time which is taken as they said is around 2 uh, minutes would basically be there for a non expert user who has not used that and this has been very well validated so this is the third site thumb you have to just compare the thumb for that and you will be able to find on that so just to look at the x ray closely and compare to the different sites you will get that so again radius you have to compare in that situation you will compare and you will find that there are multiple images which are available which you can compare and then decide from that situation and finally for ulna you compare in that situation so based on once you have done that you will get a precise estimate of bone age and as they uh, said it is very close to the standard methods and you will get a specific answer to that in that regard so this area this we already talked about so now we have discussed about how to decide which child is short we have then decided uh, whether it's physiological or pathological now how do we really run this whole algorithm and this is the most important part because our growth interpreter basically involves each of these steps so when you enter your data it will take all of that data and there will be around 80 different diagnoses they will give one of them so at the end it looks very simple but it's actually coming from a lot of information which is put up so what you look at is the high standard deviation score more than minus 2 nothing needs to be done i think this is we already discussed because between minus 2 to minus 3 now this time is short but not very short the next question is could it will be a familial short -sighted? So, if the corrected high standard deviation score is more than 1.5, what does it mean, Narayan? Not so, if it's, it's a familial. So, if it's more than that, it's familial. So, it's less than minus 1.4, minus 5. So, this becomes familial. We don't say you stop here. You follow them up for some time and see how they're growing. Now, once you have done that, the next step is CDG. For that. we basically talk about a high standard deviation score of bone age more than minus 2 if it's more than minus 2 what does it mean sir it's a cdg it's like a cdg so that is there now if your child is less than minus 2 and you have got a high sds for bone age which is basically less than minus 2 a correct height sds which is less than minus 1.5 this is not familial not cdg this is a pathological cause most likely and you have to evaluate so between minus 2 to minus 3 we do some screening test and the screening test we suggest are the basic tbc alt creatinine ttg is pretty much here and rta we have found that it usually is very unlikely beyond 3 years so if somebody has got beyond 3 years do not do a blood gas in anyone if it's less than 3 year you can do the blood gas now if these screening tests are normal and you are between minus 2 to minus 3 you can wait and watch we are not saying that you rush ahead with the growth hormone test now you evaluate this child for follow up now if you follow up over 6 to 12 months and if the height is about 25th percentile for age and the criteria are already been played 
then you don't do any follow up if the height is less you have to evaluate further now the third arm is less than minus 3 this is 80% pathology risk so this you have to be very careful in that regards so you look at faces and body proportion you look at screening investigations again the same ones if the screening investigations are normal then comes in the third aspect the bmi standard deviation score if the bmi standard deviation score is uh, or and now the growth also comes back here so again those who are minus 2 to minus 3 not growing well will come back here if the bmi standard deviation score is less than minus 1 this means it's nutritional so you look at the other things like iga blood gas and fecal calprotectin beyond 10 minutes so what is fecal calprotectin for the thing so ibd it's a marker of inflammatory bowel disease now if this is normal then you go ahead with thinking of growth hormones so what we have done is we have not done igf one till now if you look at here very carefully we have not done karyotype now we would do karyotype of course if there are clinical features of turners here we will definitely do faces in proportion we are looking at otherwise we are not doing it every girl till this point so this is saving a number of karyotypes and if you really look at our data and lot of other data <coughs> the chances of finding turner syndrome in a absolutely asymptomatic girl who has no other features with short stature is 2% so although we always say that <coughs> to carry it up in everybody do it in a selected population once you have included all of the causes now in that setting you look karyotype and all those things when that is normal you look for growth hormone and if growth hormone is low this is ght then you do igf1 if i give for this glow in only that case we have to look at sg and iss other differentiation so if you look at here there are four key differentiating points height standard deviation score into three categories uh, correct height standard deviation score into familiar versus non familiar height standard deviation score for bone age into cdgp non cdgp and then bmi standard deviation score which finally classified into nutrition and the rest so these are the initial questions we had to begin with now we have come back to the same questions and answers in that regard <coughs> and this is how the algorithm will run you will say height is less than minus 3 syndromic features absent disproportionate absent you do the screening test they say it's normal bmi is below minus 1 do nutritional workup normal do karyotype if that is normal do a growth hormone test and give you all the information for growth hormone also testing there then if it's more than 10 gsd is out igf1 is normal child is sca no this looks like you have a very short stage so this is just one diagnosis so there will be hundreds of diagnoses which will be possible whatever algorithm you are coming at so it's like quick yes and no will give you the answer in that regards and when we validated this in our own data we found that there was a 99% concordance between the diagnosis that the app suggested as compared to what was observed by the actual clinical data so this has been very well validated we plan to do it in a multi center study subsequently now we have got various growth tools available which is basically the approach pathway we got the growth interpreter which provides the documentation and the phone age tool which we already discussed on that so now we'll start off with the cases and uh, pratik uh, will start and help us starting the cases so pratik is uh, doing fellowship under us and uh, he'll start off with the first situation thank you sir so we have a 12 year old girl who height is 152 cm weight is 20 kg now father is 163 cm mother is 150 so if we plot this on the growth chart we see that the girl is coming less than 3rd centimeter and weight is somewhere around 3rd centimeter but now we need to see whether it is actually short stature is significant or not so then when we plot in the growth chart we see uh, first we see the mph and we see according to the mph the child is coming within the mph or the predicted target height at the end so now when we see further it is actually the height age is less but it is coming in the target height at the end so height age is 9 years weight age is also 9 years so what do you think pratik here So per se, height age and weight age are same, but then it is coming in the height age. We will see further. So what is your overall impression on this? So per se, I would not be worried that much because it is coming in the target height as yes. And if we look at our own app interpretation, what it is telling us is that this looks like a familial short stature. So if you really uh, 
look at it basically shows that the pmi sds is on the lower side it basically suggests that this is again a situation of a familial short stature because the height standard deviation which is corrected is actually normal in that situation so you look it back in that perspective as to what the app is showing is that the bmi standard deviation score is actually minus 3 but your target height standard deviation score is more than minus 1.5 so what it means is that this is classically a situation of a familial short stature so this is if you just look at the growth chart that also tells you the same story the app is just giving it in a more objective fashion no need of workup required in that regards and uh, maybe uh, uh, next question so we have a 12 year old girl uh, we have a 12 year old girl whose height is 120 cm weight is 15 kg now mother is 150 57 cm and father is 170 cm now at this point a bone age was done which showed that bone age of 10 mm so when we look at the this cell was further evaluated found that basic screening testing was normal in the form of hemoglobin psh and tg now at this point a bit someone assumed uh, that the igf1 level and basal growth hormone level would be a good idea to do and igf1 level came low and basal growth hormone level came low So now, Riddhi, what do you think about this child? Do you think this child has growth hormone deficiency? No, sir, it's not look like IGF. Yeah, Riddhi, are you there? Yeah, as compared to the height, so it looks like here so weight and height both like are equally affected. So this it looks like nutritional growth. Now, now you can switch to the the, uh, the interpretation. So this is what we did from our app. And what we found out here is that the BMI standard deviation score is minus 3.7. So the, what does it mean, Sian? If your BMI standard deviation score is minus 3.7, nutritional. nutritional. So this growth hormone becomes extremely unlikely. So just by looking at this chart, you will know that this is a nutritional pattern growth failure. Next case, Swati. So a 10-year-old boy, the height of 100 centimeters, weighing 18 kgs. The mother is 150 centimeters, father is 163 centimeters. Now here, when the bone age was done, it was shown that the bone age is seven. Your basic investigations, however, showed that the slightly raised TTG of 32, and other investigations are normal. However, there was no effect of gluten-free diet. Do you think this is like a celiac disease case? No, sir. Here the height is more affected as compared to the weight because so for the 10-year-old boy, height is only about five. Phenomena. So this is a classical case in which the weight is uh, uh, less affected, it's the height which is more affected. So if you look at more objective parameter in our growth chart, you will get it very clearly. So what you are seeing here is that BMI SDS is plus 0.6. So when the BMI SDS plus 0.6, what does it mean, uh, Narayan? It goes against the nutrition because you should do a TTG. We have said that it can still be CGI disease, but don't rely just on a TTG. Unless a TTG is more than 200, you need to do a biopsy. That's very, very important for this study. So the big message, uh, Pratik, from this case again is that you should look at the growth chart or our growth indicator before you do a investigation. It really says it looks like an endocrine pattern growth phase. Next case is a 14-year-old girl. Her height is 100 centimeters, weighing 32 kg. Uh, if you look at the individual observed. The basic investigations done were not good. So now, if you look at the individual, there are certain clinical pointers which are available. Uh, so, Riti, what would like to look at this girl? So, uh, here, the uh, shield chest is visible, and uh, so what do you see now? So. It looks like Turner on uh, clinical pointers, or oh, there is also brachymetacarpia. So this looks like Turner syndrome. So Turner is very important in girls, but what we have found that if you are having a good examination skills, 95% Turner will be picked up by you. So it is very unlikely that every girl, if you do stereotype the yield, may be less. But this is something which needs to be validated in a bigger study in that regard. So we have put. Stereotype definitely it's there there, but it is after excluding a lot of these causes because that will save a number of stereotypes. You do if you do every girl, the number will be ten times more than what we did in our study. So this is another message that always be back. You know, now FSH is seventy two. Uh, are you happy with this, Riti, or you want to do something else? 
No, I want to do a uh, karyotype because I want to rule out the Y cell line. If it is there, then we have to remove the gonads. Yeah, very important that even if your FNH is high and she looks like Turner, you have to exclude a Y line because that can cause gonadoblastoma. You have to be very cautious about that. The next uh, case is a seven-year-old boy with growth failure. His height is one zero two centimeters and weight is sixteen kg. Uh, this individual, this child had doll-like faces and with growth hormone which was low and alcohol level was low. So, on further evaluation, it was found that this boy had liver of centimeters of HCPT was eight eighty one. So, Riddhi, do you think this is growth hormone deficiency? She looks like doll faces, low IGF. No, with this, with this much of hypotomegaly, uh, growth hormone deficiency is less likely. We have to think in terms of storage disorder. Why is IGF one so low? Because the weight is also affected. So because of the malnutrition, the IGF one is uh, uh, remains low. And also, your liver disease is also there. If there is a liver disease, the IGF one is produced by the liver. So again. You have to be very cautious with IGF-1. A lot of people do IGF-1 leaking for the We are not talking about that. The reason is that it affected by nutrition, by age, by liver disease, and we don't have very good references available. So in this case, this IGF-1 less than 50 is of no value at all in this situation. And when we worked up further, I think we found that there was there was induced for the at the time of hypoglycemia, there was ketone first, so this ketotic hypoglycemia. With normal level of lactate present. So this pointed us towards the GSD 3, 6, or 9, and this came out to be a GSD 9. So again, a big message that not always think of an endocrine cause, think of other systemic causes before you do a proper evaluation in this case. So next is the 12 year old boy with height 150 centimeters, weighing 70 kg. Mother is 150 centimeters, father is 163, and here the bone age is 12. So at this point, the evaluation of the action got a TSM level to 7.91. So, do you think Riddhi, this child is obese because of this thyroid? He was labeled as hypothyroidism and advised treatment. Do you agree? No, sir, because uh, his height is pretty much good, 160 centimeters. So, it uh, looks like constitutional obesity. And uh, mildly elevated TSH in constitutional obesity is the effect of obesity, not the cause of obesity. So now if you look at the growth the interpreted with us, so the key parameter here would be to look at height standard deviation score. If your height standard deviation score is positive, it is unlikely to be pathological. So the most important thing to look at in a child with short stature is time. Weight. Weight. And the most important thing to look at in a fat child is the height. Because that will help you distinguish between the cause. So here if you see the high standard deviation score is, uh, is actually on the positive side. So he's tall. As we said, this is unlikely to be hypothyroidism. And do you think this TSA is going to do any harm to him, Riddhi? Um... Definitely not, but we have to evaluate in terms of complication because in my own study, it is shown that subclinical hypothyroidism has higher chances of developing uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So we have to uh, screen this child for the complications. Yes, so as we say that this obesity is not because of a disease, it becomes a disease. So you have to look for fatty liver, dyslipidemia, all those things. And we have you already shown that it is three times more likely to have a fatty liver if you have a high DS. A uh, 12 year old girl with height 130 centimeters and weight 58 kg. Now, uh, normal screening. So, initial screen tests were normal, but then <laughs> they, there was a rapid weight gain. And if you look at the uh, if you look at the growth chart, you can see here that the height is not as high. Like the height age is much lower than the weight age. So she was labeled as a constitutional obesity. Do you agree with that, Riddhi? No, sir, because here height is much more affected and there is history of rapid weight gain in recent onset. So definitely uh, this is uh, something else, not the uh, nutritional. So, so if we now go into our chart, what we'll get out here is that 
the key parameter is the high standard deviation score. So if you look at the high SPS, it is minus 2.5. So this is short and plump. Short and plump is basically an endocrine cause. And this turned out to be, if you look at the picture, she remains she's no normal. But then if you look at the picture, she clearly has a pushing word. And OHDSP showed that it was a non-suppressed cortisol level. So that's still her pushing. 